Hello, so welcome to this edition of Coaching Conversations with a twist. Um, as you probably know and remember, last year I did a video about menopause um, and we got such a great response. Um, it put me in touch with some amazing people, one of which is my guest today, Clarissa Christiansen. Hello, Clarissa. Hello, Amantha. I'm delighted to be here. Oh, yes, me too. Me too. Um, and, and so it's been a little while since we've talked about menopause in this environment, but I wanted to do a special video with Clarissa, given that we've had quite um, a good week for menopause in the United Kingdom. Um, we've had Sadiq Khan, the current uh, mayor of London, saying that if he gets voted back in, he will actually have a menopause policy um, under his leadership. And that is absolutely fantastic. We also know in the same week that um, the, the Department of Health have actually put out a 12 week consultation to every person in the United Kingdom about women's health. And obviously menopause, um, periods, menstruation, you know, uh, polycystic ovary, all those conditions that affect women, um, we need to hear about because if the policymakers know about this stuff, they can do something about it. So um, it, my guest is not in the UK. She's in Sweden and has just moved home. So we're so grateful that you're here today, Clarissa. So, so um, to introduce you, you're a menopause mentor. Tell us a little bit about that role, if you will. Yes. So one of the things I got very into was rather than coach women, I think women need to be encouraged and helped. They need places where they can build community, where they have sounding boards. And that's why I started my podcast as well, to build a community where you could listen, where there was no judgment. You know, you go in, you listen, you learn, but also to mentor women. I think deep down, lots of women know what to do I mean we know the how but it's it's the doing that's the hard part how do I actually switch to you know eating more healthily how can I be supported to go on the journey and a big part of my job is mentoring you to go on the journey of menopause from being a pre-menopausal woman which the world loves I mean we love this woman she's bright she's sexy she's she's all the things we're meant to be whether we are that or not that image to be going into what Myself and one of my good friends, um, Karen Randall, who's a transpersonal psychologist, and I work quite closely with her, we call this no man's land, this sort of space where you hang out. And that's what a menopause is like. And we're like, I can't go back, but I don't know what the future really looks like. I can look at other women, but I'm not sure. How do we go through that journey and be really well prepared to grab hold of the next 30, 40, maybe even 50 years of our life. And that's what I do with women. And I help them go on that journey. That's such an important point, isn't it? So to remind our viewers who, who are watching this, you know, there are those three distinct chapters, you know, the perimenopausal stage, the, the menopausal stage, which is one day only, and then the postmenopausal stage. And um, yeah, I mean, I think the thing from my own personal viewpoint is um, I don't fit the stereotype. Um, but in fact, I am a menopausal woman. And, and, and so we have a lot of these stigmas attached with being menopausal um, that really, um, when you look at the statistics, the number of women leading, leaving senior leadership positions because of the unbearable stigma, the symptoms, the, you know, the lack of facility available to support them. Um, it's no wonder that we have a spiraling epidemic of anxiety in this, in this age group. And, and so the holistic side of it is really important. So um, can we talk a bit about the anxiety for women? I mean, how does that progress during this time? Look, I think it's become the symptom that has grown the most. It's the one women are presenting with the most and that it's the hardest to talk about because we aren't always, you know, a mess. We can be a highly functioning anxiety sufferer. And I think that's part of the problem with females that we often are. We look incredibly capable on the outside, but we're not. Of course, it's not just menopause. I mean, our hormones are changing the fluctuations of key hormones. I mean, progesterone is a hormone that helps us to buffer stress in our younger years, and it's our soothing, calming hormone. So obviously that drops like a stone, as we know, 
to you know 65 percent. so it, it's at very low maintenance levels as we go through this period and then we've got estrogen which obviously has huge emotional components attached to it it works on our brain and it also is an integral important precursor to the production of serotonin in the gut which is our happy mood hormone so we're we're faced with both of those and i think when we hit that an average, and there is no average time for menopause, let's be fair. We are super, super busy. We are juggling uh, 5,000 things and we're dropping lots of balls and we're, we're not able to cope. We're often at the height of our careers. We have children of varying degrees. And if you're like many women in business, you might have small children and be perimenopausal. You're not having, like our parents would have had us in our te late teens and 20s. We're juggling with seven-year-olds or teenagers and then we'll also have our parents and all the pressures of just what it means to be a modern woman and I think when those will come together there's a sort of oh god I can't cope and we become more anxious we are stressed we don't sleep and that anxiety is just compounded by the hormonal imbalances and we often don't have tools to know how to manage anxiety and that's it isn't it and it is that vicious circle because then that anxiety affects things like our gut microbiome that then and, and, it, and the disruption has just started hasn't it and and something i'm finding when i work with my coaching clients is that often unresolved anxieties from somewhere some back along they really pop up for people, don't they, at this time when it just seems like you, you know, you don't have any more capacity to take on anything else. And so for many, many women, having seen a lot of polls on LinkedIn, actually talking about what are the things that affect you the most, it, it is this anxiety. Um, so tell me, what are the attitudes around this, this particular time in a woman's life? And let's remind people, every single woman will go through it. Yes, there will be a very small percentage that say, through it hormonally unaware but actually you might be having some of these other coexisting symptoms like anxiety I mean there are so many symptoms we can talk about I'm not I'm not going to give airtime to the common ones I'm going to give some airtime to the less common ones and if you can add anyone any in particularly for me in my late 30s I was at the dentist more more often than I wanted to be with burning mouth syndrome you know we we need to understand things like that that actually estrogen affects all membranes in our body and your mouth is a mucosal membrane so so but my dentist wasn't aware of that no. He, he couldn't explain that my doctor couldn't explain it but it to the point I lost so much weight because actually I didn't want to eat because it was actually really uncomfortable mm -hmm. so so mm -hmm. I would say for me that at 36 and extreme hair loss as you can see my hair's incredibly dark um, and literally it would be coming yeah. out in clumps I would say for me that drove my anxiety more than anything else yes Yes, and I think we, we're unprepared for the less common symptoms, as you say, Mantra. I mean, we all know about hot flashes, yes, and they're very common, but they're actually, for most women, quite manageable. And we know that because we know that things like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is a highly effective technique. For some women, that there's a different, there's a different experience, but anxiety feeling isolated and low and not quite sure why the moods when we just burst into tears in in the loo you know at work and you're thinking god i'm going to come out what are people going to think i'm all pink eyed and i'm not quite sure why i feel like this but suddenly i'm just they wash over us those and, and a lot of changes with our skin and our hair as you say that well we're not ready for and we're not ready for some of the more serious issues like like uh, blood pressure women don't realize sometimes that their high blood pressure can be connected to a loss of estrogen because it's integral to many uh, functions in our body around mucosal membranes against the integrity of blood vessels and more and I'm not a doctor but you know from my training that's we yeah. know some of that is absolutely true but when you present like you did to your dentist or doctor that doesn't become the first point of conversation, whether you're 36 or you're 45, you just get treated and, and, and there we are, that's done. But there's no conversation about your hormonal status or your mental health in that. No, and actually I, what I found most frustrating was because I did present myself 
quite regularly. Um, I can remember one day, what do you think of this? I can remember one day a junior doctor was there and I was presenting with these symptoms again because I actually had coexisting histamine intolerance at the same time, which is what, you know, many viewers again may not know this, more, more allergies present during those perimenopausal years and those menopausal years. And that's because estrogen and histamine are very closely related in terms of how they, how they are balanced out in your system. And I remembered seeing that the doctor just said to me, do you think you need a holiday? And I, and I said, I probably do need a holiday, yes. Um, he, and, and he said, oh, it's just that it says here, worried well. On my notes, it actually said worried well. And I said, can you make sure that is removed from my yeah. notes? I said, because that is not a clinical diagnosis. No, it's not a clinical diagnosis. And, you know, I was on a very interesting call. I belong to the University of British Columbia's Women's Brain Health Group, group as a yeah. member of that group. And there was a very senior neuropsychologist saying, you know, women are dismissed all the time for their brain fog and not just by male doctors, but by female doctors of doctors of different ages, you know, just they're a bit neurotic, exactly worried. Well, dismissed, nothing really wrong. And, and without the understanding the implications of what this means down the line for women's health, health but given that we are 60% plus of dementia sufferers. Exactly. And, and, and again, it's all those other things that go around it, isn't it? You know, um, you know, just having someone to be able to talk to openly, I think it's so much better, honestly, since the, since, you know, Instagram, um, you know, Twitter, I think the, there is a positivity in some of these platforms, but again, I think we're reaching a bit of a, a, a sort of precipice with it. It's like, well, well, how much more do, can we discuss? Well, I think there are so many things that we can discuss in terms of how women like ourselves can help ourselves, because I think you quickly get to the point where you go, they're not going to help me. So what do I need to do for myself? And this is where the holistic part is really, really powerful, isn't it? So, so what can we advocate for, for women who are either starting on this journey or as a result of our conversation again well hang on a minute okay there's some things there that I definitely know are true for me um what what sort of things can we suggest for them well I would firstly be saying very much about our own self-awareness we're incredibly disconnected from listening to ourselves so if you were a younger woman I would be saying if you have the opportunity to really tune into your body uh to start tracking your own periods I mean and I know a lot of young women are beginning to become more interested in this there's a, a few younger women that I'm connected to that are working with women and their menstrual cycles what it means to listen to your own body because if we're not listening to our body when we're younger we're going to find we're not doing that a bit later and we need to maybe be a little bit more tuned in because of the implications for our longer term health so it really begins there that, and then having a mindset that is also very curious and open. I want to learn about menopause, not say as I have, you know, I could, I could open my LinkedIn conversations I've had with young women who answer me, well, I'm not 50, so it's nothing to do with me. Exactly. And I'm thinking, you know, this is about your whole journey. It's about how you set yourself up. If you have, as you mentioned, the gut microbiome, the stronger your gut microbiome is now, the better that part of it that's called the estrobilome, which is about processing estrogen in the body. So we don't have, in fact, excesses, which sounds weird in a world of, of decline, but you don't want to exacerbate the imbalances between estrogen and progesterone in the body because that's when your symptoms show up. So building up a strong, healthy gut, working on a brain, making sure that your life has uh, time for downtime, for rest, for pause when you put that. Those things are going to help you because you're strengthening not just the individual parts of your brains of your body, but you're also strengthening your vagus nerve, which is an important part of managing stress better. So yeah. that's what we want. That's what we want women who are younger to be doing is in preparing a good level of, I'd say, all round resilience so that when this hormonal imbalance happens, and it will, because it's part of our journey, we're better prepared on every level. That's so true, Clarissa. I mean, my daughter's 15 and um, 
So, I mean, I just think we're both experiencing the same thing, but at two different end points, you know, her hormones are coming in and mine are going out. It's both a period of fluctuation. And I would advocate to any parent of a teenager and it's not just the mother you know dads as well it's really important that you sort of can support them with this I mean my daughter uses an app to monitor her periods right now it's interactive it appeals to young the, the younger generation but I think you're absolutely right for three years my lovely husband put a, an excel spreadsheet for me because there wasn't an app back then <laughs> um but it was fascinating clarissa and it, it, it negated the need to be sent away and told to monitor it it sort of mm. shortcutted the whole process and i could see very very clearly that the trend for me was that my periods were getting um heavier much heavier and a shorter duration between them and then it would go through um a much bigger duration and then lighter. And um, so it was giving all that evidence to a GP um, mm. to at least start a, start a process. Um, mm. and, but I think, I think you're right, because when, if I come back to how I work with my clients, which is the, that awareness piece also presents opportunities to go, okay, what is adding to this that is outside of what's happening to my, to my hormones? Because if we can downregulate that cortisol, yeah. either because of relationship issues you know um that might be coexisting alongside this time um difficulties that you've had you know maybe not feeling on top of your game in terms of work we can actually work and tease out you know what are you good at let's get some things for you to land on that maybe you've never realized about mm -hmm. yourself but in this moment in this transition in your life you can afford to re feel really really good about and i think often for women that is something it also accelerates the need to do that work so you can feel really positive about where you are, make those positive life decisions. Um, and for me, some of the holistic things that I've really landed on, which have been really helpful, um, things like um, magnesium spray to help me sleep. Mm. I spray on a, an oil. I mean, that has completely fixed my sleep because I don't wake in the night. I used to wake mm. at exactly 1.58 every single night for absolutely no apparent reason. Um, but now I've topped up my magnesium levels. I'm looking after my, you know, my all round. <laughs> oh, you've got a dog. <laughs> She's here. <laughs> Little Pinny Minnie. She's interested in menopause. She says, I've got to get in there and tell yeah, them. Yeah, she's not going to have a menopause. Dogs, <laughs> and actually, dogs don't. <laughs> but she's not having anything. Like no, no, no. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so these sorts of things. And actually, um, I also did have um, some DNA uh, profiling done. And that was really helpful for yeah. me because I can see actually, although I, I've gone through the menopause, I have to be careful about, um, I do take HRT, mm -hmm. but I'm very, very mindful that I, I shouldn't be taking a lot of it um, yes. because I've got all sorts of enzyme issues. So I think this mm -hmm. awareness is not just here in our heads, is it? And in our bodies, but it's a, it's a combination. And I suppose the thing to also say to people is there's a continuum, isn't there? We're not, neither of us are saying it has to be one or the other. No, no it's always a journey. And we've got to remember that this peri to post menopause transition is a journey. We're not going to have massively difficult symptoms the whole time. Only 20% of women have very severe symptoms that do require intervention. And let's be fair, there can be a lot of other pre-consisting conditions here. You know, if we have a severe mental health issue, if we've suffered actually, as we came back to our conversation about anxiety, if that has been something that you have suffered in pre-menopause, then you need to work with your psychologist or even psychiatrist. If you're bipolar, if you're schizophrenic, we need help. We can't do some of the emotional mental changes, you know, just on our own. So we need to recognize there are lots of reasons that we need that. But for a lot of us, the kind of symptoms come and go and you can think, oh, it's kind of all over and then it comes back. Uh, and there's like waves, waves of it. And, and none of us know what that looks like, but there is a certain amount of genetics, past medical history, even our race and ethnicity that will play a role in this and being aware of that can help you to preempt your experience to a certain extent. Yeah, and that's so powerful because I, I remember one of the best bits of advice I had was what were your mum's periods like? What was your mum's um, transition like? And, and I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, if that's gonna be me. I mean, my mum had a terrible time, really yeah. terrible. Yeah. And, you know, flooding, you know, literally being at work as a nurse and a lovely kind friend saying to her, actually, I just need to walk you out because 
you know you're leaking I mean it yeah. just is horrific yes. and you, I mean I just am so lucky in many ways that I wasn't in the corporate mm -hmm. world I don't know how I would have coped with it Clarissa you know because no. I had the same symptoms that my mum had um, yeah. and so this is important you know and and generally our journey with fertility is an important one to communicate to our children so yes. that they know they can make some lifestyle choices and 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 that's really important so so can we talk a little bit about how we can you know affect that vagus nerve which I've talked uh, quite a bit about in terms of how it affects you know the stress response what what sort of things can we advocate that can positively affect our vagus nerve response well some of that is definitely about learning to slow down become a human being not a doing and we need to find ways that we strengthen breathing techniques are hugely beneficial in strengthening our vagus nerve and learning to breathe correctly is something I advocate and have advocated because I know the minute we have stress and anxiety we breathe up here so we breathe like in a fight flight response yeah. very shallowly we're not getting enough oxygen into the into the system and obviously we're not having a good exchange system but breath goes much further than that it wouldn't be as central to some of our more eastern cultures and medicine if it didn't have the power beyond just you know breathing in and out which of course all of us do all the time unconsciously from the moment we're born till the moment we die yeah. but being able to direct breath and use it use it as a way to calm down use it even to help your metabolism so if you think about it, you know, I'm not a big one about weight loss or anything, but actually you can activate your fat metabolism and help your body that way and another way through using breath. So learning breathing techniques, and I was incredibly inspired by Ed Harold's book, you know, Life is Breath, and he's yeah. a very well-known yogic uh, teacher. And I did his course and learned how to teach other people how to breathe better. Yeah, and that again is so, so fascinating um, because this is where we have that synergy because w when we talk about stress, there is a direct link between the rest of your body, you know, that gut brain axis, neurotransmitters which are made in your gut travel via your vagus nerve and and it's so so important and so things like meditation, you know, people have all sorts of um, assumptions about what meditation and breathing is and isn't and one of the things one of the first place I often advocate for my clients is just do a bit of belly breathing if you want more guided do something you know the calm app headspace there are so many apps available yes. insight timer they, they yeah. all guide you through it but you know five minutes of meditation does more positivity for your neurology and yeah. the whole body connection than, than probably five minutes of exercise um, because this is the thing the breathing that's associated with exercise is a very different type of breathing isn't it absolutely we're trying to breathe quite fast we're trying to get oxygen into the system to actually be able to exercise because exercise is good because it elevates and then lowers cortisol levels and it's very good if you're brain foggy yeah, yeah, definitely. And that was one of the things that I found, and I'm sure I'm not alone during the lockdown that we, we've, we're coming out of. Um, mm -hmm. And I would put on a stone during lockdown. Yeah. Ironically, it was at a time that I was doing more exercise than the previous 12 months, and I just mm -hmm. couldn't understand it. So of course, I, I go back to the doctor, I have my thyroid checked, I'm told it's yeah. normal. Um, but then when you do a little bit more investigation, I found that actually, as we progress through the menopause, our metabolism naturally slows down anyway so the type of exercise you do is really critical during yes. your the menopause and and um what i would certainly advocate for people is i started doing more weights yep. less less running around actually because you're we, we just hold on to our fat in in the menopause years but to lift weights it does two things it it helps build that that mass for your bones and the yeah. muscles that support it so we become less likely to become osteopenic um but also we, we keep that muscle tone which we tend to lose as we get older so yeah. so i mean in terms of yoga and, and holistic, uh, you know, things like that and Pilates, what are your thoughts about yoga, Pilates? I think that those things that help us to actually build strength, because what we're looking for is, is, is a form of strength. Weights are very good because they keep muscle mass, as you said. But you can do that also through supporting your own body weight, which is a lot of what um, Pilates and yoga do is that you're learning to, you know, plank and and, and lie on balls and build up strength in your body. And they're also at times 
less stressful on your pelvic uh, area because things like a lot of this jumping up and down that gyms seem to be extremely fond of for some reason which i learned because i've got a, a knee that could be better yeah <laughs> um can also not help you if you have it if you have some pelvic floor issues and we and you know as we get older and again there's estrogen playing its role there because we're we're not quite as able to hold the pelvic rod, which is a bit like a little hammock at the bottom Ooh. of the body that keeps an awful lot of things in we are we can then go to more pilates exercises yoga exercises that are building a lot of body strength and they're good because they're calm, they can be very calming to help us to breathe better i mean they're different i mean the, the different types of breathing and moving but they're so good for us yeah and, and, that, and, that's, home. <laughs> yeah, and that's the key isn't it um i showed you a book that i'm reading at the moment about strengthening your brain and one of the most fascinating things that i discovered in reading that is actually movement of any type it's your muscles to make this building block that basically makes happy hormones in your head and keeps your brain young so you know if exercising isn't your thing fine but just move keep moving and, and keep moving and and that does so much good for you and and naturally when we then get outside in nature I mean you're you just described to me that you're in the most beautiful place I mean if I, I could just if I could just time travel there <laughs> describe for people where you are in Sweden and what's around you my goodness. I know. so where I live is nature personified you know it really is I live in a, a house that is it's not remote because I have neighbors and I can sort of see them occasionally but I have a nature reserve next to my house and my whole grounds are just they're unmanicured so you know here in Sweden we don't go around manicuring your garden and building lawns very often it you know it doesn't survive the winter no. <laughs> and and it's all just moss and trees and bushes and and I look out and there's little lambs playing in the field out there and then we look and we can see the sea so we're surrounded by nature very very untouched I mean if you ripped away the the fences I'd say to me you know our Viking ancestors would have had exactly the same <laughs> and I said to my husband there's a place called Sven's Meadow Sven's Inge. and I said oh that's so nice and he goes what do you mean he says Sven probably cut somebody's head off there and everybody celebrated him for doing it <laughs> back <laughs> in the like, day yeah, thanks. yeah, yeah. yeah back in the <laughs> back in the day <laughs> that's so lovely and that in itself is so important isn't it for our well-being our mood um, and it's finding those things that can lift you when you need need them um you know if you can have a little back catalog of things that you can refer to and and just getting outside can be enough even to have a coffee do it mindfully think about all the good things that are going on in your life because <laughs> because there you go she likes that point she's mentioning outside she's like wanting to go yeah, she wants to go out i yeah, know yeah, she yeah, wants yeah, to go yeah. out yeah yeah no, 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 no. Yeah, she just wants to join in. She's very cheeky, yeah. actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's she very when... cheeky today. She doesn't like the fact we've got the builders on the roof and she can hear them. And she quite likes them as well, you see. So oh, she, I see. What she really wants to do is to have a hug. She's had a greet and a hug. Yeah. But, but being out here, we go for walks. And obviously she powers at 90 mile an hour, so I better keep up. But I see, and I was going to say, I see a lot of older people here in Scandinavia big into Nordic walking. And, yeah. you know, in Finland, they've used that in their hospital system as a way to rehabilitate people who've had serious operations. And you just, you have your two poles and you think you're not doing that, but you're moving your whole body. Yeah. And it's incredible that, you know, walking at a certain pace, you learn how to walk with them. You can go for a walk. And I see a lot of people who are 70 and 80 powering around country lanes here with their walking sticks. And um, they're, they're amazing, you know. Yeah, so yeah. this isn't they're not needing to lift weights or go to a gym. They're, they're using our natural body movement to feel well and stay well. Exactly. And that's and that's the thing. I'm not a massive fan of the gym. I really it's not it's not for me, you know, but I like to exercise at home and and those those feelings of well-being. I find I become more creative, you know. And so when we talk mm -hmm. about that brain fog, I don't get it as often now. But if I do, the very first thing I just stop what I'm doing mm -hmm. and I go out, which is why I do quite a lot of LinkedIn posts outside, because yes. I just think, right, I'm just going to double up and I, and I get really good creative ideas. And and that's mm -hmm. that's what we're learning. You can get up to 30 percent extra from your frontal mm -hmm. cortex by yes. just moving. So, you know, yeah. 
there's no excuses really we should we should all be doing that and so and things like you know I mean, I mean skincare I mean you know one of the things for us ladies is when we do start to notice actually I've changed my makeup for example yeah um, I've changed how I how I use makeup um because it can be another chapter of discovery what do you yeah. what do you think Clarissa I think it is I think we're discovering that we look different our skin is different our tone is different um we may want to present differently than when we were younger and I think we're more confident in ourselves so you know knock yourself out and wear bright lipstick if that's what you like doing and you wanted to all the time and you didn't yeah I think the choice is ours and I think that that's the great thing but we do need to care for ourselves differently I've noticed that I'm a lot drier I mean some of that is the climate here because it's just much drier there's very little humidity in the air but we are dry. our skin is drier it's more prone to you know wrinkling that's all estrogen related so we need to take a different line on care you're absolutely right and we can sometimes discover that we're more sensitive yes and have flare-ups and, and you know acne is one of those unspoken things that can definitely surface oh my it for, for many women and it's that really sebaceous type of acne uh, yeah. for anyone watching isn't it it's like the pores are under the skin oh yeah and, you know whatever you do ladies and gents, if you do get sebaceous acne, yeah. just not to squeeze yeah. it. I had it as a girl and oh. I did the opposite of what you were meant to do. And it was a re it took ages to, to get rid of. It's the worst thing. And that is actually a symptom, isn't it? I mean, one of the things I noticed was I used to get quite quite bad acne here and yeah. under my under yeah. my chin. It's very, yes. very common here and, and around here. So if yes. you are noticing, that is a, a perimenopausal symptom, you know, um, as well as for teenagers. So I think yes. that's quite a nice correlation that what happens to teenagers happens to, happens to us. Happens, yeah. happens to us as well so so um as we sort of bring this to a close you know if if you if you were to give a top tip for what would have helped you what would you say i think having someone to connect with someone to talk to instead of trying to sort of well i don't think i knew what perimenopause was anyway but you know but having someone to be able to say well is what i'm experiencing common not normal because normal is, is the wrong word but is it a common thing or am I in some way something wrong with me and having someone for me to say I'm not alone there's there's lots of other women going through this and I'm not going somehow slightly crazy would be the best tip so I, I would say to that reach out into positive communities and that's incredibly important because there's a lot of downloading every angst in life and we don't need to add that because we love that we suck it up and take it yes, on board exactly. but find co positive communities talk to friends open up the conversation and if you're a business leader tell your teams particularly your female teams because if we don't talk about it it doesn't change and then people will feel safe to speak up themselves yeah, absolutely. And I would concur with that completely because I think I did keep myself to myself um, and that doesn't help you really. I think the minute you start talking about it, it's like most of these things, isn't it? Yeah. People go, oh, you as well you know oh let me tell you about this and and you know and, and that is there's something very disarming about that and something very collaborative and connecting and so I would agree with you I would also say I would add one of the things that despite my initial journey being so terrible in feeling like I was diagnosed as a worried well was actually to have the evidence because when you get yourself in front of the right people they go oh my goodness yeah. you have been struggling for some time yeah. let me take hold of this for you initially um let's look at some things you know and that has the power and capacity to make you feel thank goodness i wasn't going you know off on a different tangent you know i wasn't making it up and i think we need more of that and and i would agree with you i would say come on leaders you know if you really do value your female workforce you need to step up we need to see many more policies. We need to say that it is, we need to actually not be talking about it, Clarissa. It needs to be, <laughs> it needs to, it needs to be common it's practice, exactly. doesn't it? it? It should. It should just be part of our everyday conversation. It should be something. And I think in many ways, it's as much about being able to talk about menstruation as it is being able to talk about menopause. We're not asking for special treatment or some sort of weirdness. We're asking for much more of an understanding on this journey and knowing that, you know, 
things fluctuate, things change. And, and maybe the more women leaders can speak up, can support and get men. I think men want, on the whole want to help us, but they haven't got a clue what we're talking about. So if we don't engage people in the conversation, then things are not going to change at all. So we want men to come on board and not feel concerned that we don't want you on the journey. We do. We definitely That do. is so important because some, someone who has supported me completely has been my lovely husband. Um, and he could probably be on the call and tell you about as much about it as I could say, because actually you do have to lean on somebody. Um, mm. And it usually is your partner, whoever your partner is, a, a man, a woman, um, or family members. And, and so, yes, I think it is a shared process because we're all going to go through it together so you know we might as well just put the sum total and get the best out of it so yeah so so Clarissa thank you so much for being my guest today tell me what's on on the horizon for you what exciting things have you got coming up what have I got coming up well I am doing a couple of exciting things I'm going to be launching a membership site very soon where we're going to talk much more about this journey of transition. So we're going to go into that nice, quiet, more mindful spiritual space, which I think is is a bit that gets a little bit lost in the treating symptoms space. Yes. So we can go a bit deeper and think, how do I go on this journey in a way that's supportive? And I've got some podcast specials coming up because some really big team, themes and topics have emerged as I interview wonderful people around the world and we're going to build those together to some bigger more themed conversations that I hope people will be interested in diving oh into. for sure I've listened to your podcast and they are excellent you just get the best guests on so tell people how can they get in your space with you what's the best way to be in touch with you so you can either go to my website which is my name clarissachristiansen.com or you can connect with me on LinkedIn because I'm always there Yes, you really are always there. And so it would be really if you are a perimenopausal woman, menopausal, postmenopausal, you're a leader who's interested to put some changes in your organisation or you're a man who just needs to just hear or a partner who needs to hear about how you can support further please you are an untapped source and of, of you know insight and energy and so thanks for being my guest so lovely to speak to you and thanks for fitting this in having just moved home um you know and and got all of that that in itself can be quite stressful but you're here smiling so thanks so much for being my lovely guest today and we must do another one next time and like I said put me on that list if you need someone to come and experience a retreat I will Amantha thank you so much for having me my guest it's been great fun thank you thanks Clarissa bye Bye.